All right, good evening. How's everybody doing out there? All right, very good. My name is Dave, and I'm a bass player. That's the real me up there on the screen. Uh, I've been blessed to have a successful career as a professional musician in Nashville for nearly 40 years. For the last eight years, I've also been president of the Nashville Musicians Association, AFM Local 257. I joined the union when I first came to town, and I'm very proud to represent Nashville musicians in this discussion tonight. So here's how I got here. I was the youngest of three kids in a military family. I was born in Naples, Italy. When I was five years old, we moved to England for three years. And in 63, it's late 62, early 63, British television erupted with the sights and sounds of a band called the Beatles. I was fascinated by those four guys who seemed to be having such a great time playing music. We moved to Northern Virginia in 1964 and at the age of 10, my life changed forever when I started playing string bass in the school orchestra. I fell in love. All through my teens, I was playing electric bass and singing in rock bands, much to my friend's amusement and my parents' dismay. <laughs> After my second year of college at the University of Virginia, I had an opportunity to go back to Europe. My dad was stationed in Belgium, so I had a plan. Quit college, go to London, and become a rock star. Simple, seemed easy. So I moved there, and in less than a week, I answered an ad, joined a band, and applied for a work permit. It was a great experience. I lived in London for a year, and I played in four different bands, including one that played a nightclub in Copenhagen, Denmark, for six hours a night, 28 nights in a row. When my work permit expired, I didn't want to go back to a local music scene, and a singer I'd worked with at UVA had moved here, so I moved to Nashville in 1977 to check it out, and I've been here ever since. I put up a makeshift business card on a music store wall and got my first Nashville gig with a road warrior named Sleepy LaBeef from Smackover, Arkansas. Known as the human jukebox, he has a repertoire of thousands of songs, rockabilly, blues, gospel, country, and everything in between and I just learned to follow him wherever he went. The working conditions were pretty rough, but it was great training for what was to come. Sleepy and I have stayed in touch over the years, and my son and I made a documentary film about him in 2012. And he's 81 and still rocking. After returning to Nashville, I met Guy Clark's drummer on a basement recording session, and he asked me to join their band. Two days later, I was sitting in that same basement learning Guy's songs from the man himself. I had never experienced music that was so simple yet so powerful, and it taught me the importance of always listening and striving to enhance, not detract from the message of the song. I played on several of his records over the years, and Guy was a great friend and mentor to me. My next gig was, without a doubt, my big break. I'd become friends with the guys in Don Williams' band, and the bass player let me know he was leaving and asked if I'd be interested in the job, and I jumped at the chance. I picked up a cassette on Tuesday, met Don and his co-producer Garth Fundus at Sound Emporium Studios on Wednesday, learned 20 songs with harmony parts and did my first show on Friday. It was the biggest crowd I'd ever played for in my life and it was also the quietest. You could hear a pin drop. Don didn't always say very much, but he taught me a lot in so many ways. He helped our band get a record deal and he and Garth produced our album for MCA in 1982. It didn't sell and the band broke up, but my dream of making a record had actually come true. I worked with Don full time for 14 years and will always be very grateful for his generosity and his kindness to me. When we were off the road, I began to do more and more studio work, mostly demos and the occasional record session. Don and Garth began to use me on his records and in 86 I played on my first number one record, Heartbeat in the Darkness. A year or so later, Garth, me, Garth called me to play on Keith Whitley's album, Don't Close Your Eyes, and in the process, I discovered that my electric upright bass was a sound that really fit Keith's voice. There were three number one singles on that album, and suddenly my phone started ringing with people looking for that sound. Sadly, Keith left us too soon, much too soon, which was a shock to us all. Trisha Yearwood was Garth's next project, and I played on her first seven albums, which was a great experience. I will always be grateful to Garth for giving me a chance to prove myself as a session player in a town with a lot of really good bass players. 
I got off the road in the early 90s and I stayed really busy staying, playing on sessions with folks like Emmy Lou, the Chieftains, Alan Jackson, James McMurtry, Allison Krauss, and the great Earl Scruggs, which was really a treat. Playing sessions is one of the greatest jobs in the world. To be presented with a great song and an artist and given a blank canvas to come up with a sound and a part that helps bring the record to life is something that I will never, ever take for granted. I love all kinds of music and it's been very fulfilling to be called to play on all kinds of different projects in different styles. Along the way, I've always been in bands like Blue Monday, Tone Patrol, and Three Ring Circle. I love to play live. In fact, I'll be at the Station Inn later on tonight with Jim Rooney if anybody's out and about. It's just around the corner, and that's always a fun gig. <laughs> Writing, performing, and making my own records are great creative outlets, and they make me a better session player and sideman as well. One of the first people who heard my all-bass instrumental music and actually pitched it around Music Row was a new guy at BMI named Jody Williams. His encouragement meant a lot to me, and it led to some lasting musical relationships. Thank you, Jody, wherever you are. Since the late 80s, I've released eight, 14 projects on my label, Earwave Music. When I co-wrote and recorded a song called The Day the Bass Players Took Over the World, it led to creating the All Bass Orchestra in the mid-90s and gave me some notoriety outside of Nashville. I'd been working with Chet Atkins, which was also an amazing privilege, and he covered the song as the title track for his final album, the day finger pickers took over the world. For those who are interested in finding out more about my music, including the Sleepy LaBeef DVD, All Bass Orchestra, Three Ring Circle, and Tone Patrol, can check it out at davepomeroy.com, the home of Earwave Music. Over the years, I've gotten more involved in the leadership of the Nashville Musicians Association, AFM Local 257, which was founded in 1902 and has been representing professional musicians ever since. In the mid-2000s, many of us became concerned that our local and national union leaders were not changing with the times, and they had lost touch with the members. In 2008, after a lot of soul searching, I decided to run for president of Local 257, and to the surprise of many, I won. Two years later, the internal revolution that started in Nashville and spread to New York hit the AFM convention, where we ran a unity ticket and swept the elections. Ray Hare was the new AFM president, and I was elected to the International Executive Board. Since then, I've been reelected twice to both offices, and we've made a lot of progress in reinventing the AFM. It's my honor to serve as an advocate for musicians. Local 257 represents all genres and types of players, from studio musicians, touring acts, club bands, and symphony players. We have recording agreements for many different budgets and purposes, and processed over $11 million in scale wages last year. We have developed innovative new agreements covering home studio overdubs, internet streaming, and pension for touring musicians. We've already made it much less expensive for publishers to convert songwriter demos to records, and I'll have another announcement very soon regarding older demos that have never been released. I negotiate the Grand Old Opry and the Nashville Symphony contracts and participate in our national negotiations with recording, film, TV, and jingle industries. Negotiations are actually a lot like being a bass player. You just bring in two sides together to meet in the middle. <laughs> Believe it, it is. <laughs> in 2012, we, we traveled to Beijing to work on the UN's Intellectual Property Treaty, and despite Congress's inaction regarding AMFM performance rights, we were able to unlock millions of dollars in payments to musicians and artists from foreign collectives. Last May, I spoke on Capitol Hill in support of the bipartisan Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, which would correct this long-standing trade imbalance and unlock a huge source of worldwide revenue for American music creators. Despite our efforts, there are still misconceptions out there about the AFM. We are not thugs. We are problem solvers, and we represent those who are too often taken advantage of. AFM recording contracts have pension and health and welfare contributions built in, and in some cases, a residual stream as well. But to be very clear, despite false claims made at a previous Who Knew event by someone who knows better, there are no back-end residuals to players on AFM video game contracts. And if anybody wants me to say that again, I'll say it again. We pride ourselves on our positive relationships with many employers, but it takes two to tango. When a record is used in TV or film, 
uh, or a commercial, the licensee is obligated to make new use payments to musicians who played on the record. Patsy Cline's Back in Baby's Arms was used in a recent Mazda TV ad campaign, and when an 89-year-old violinist named Soli Fott came in to pick up a check from Mazda for a song cut in 1962, it made my day. Getting musicians paid is my second favorite thing in the world, right after playing the bass. Thank you. Appreciate it. I love it. Uh, recently, I was honored to have one of my basses put in, on display at the Musicians Hall of Fame in downtown Nashville. This town has been great to me, and I love being in the position of trying to make things better for the next generation of musicians. We are currently running a membership drive, and we welcome anyone to come talk to us about what we do. The door is always open. Music City was built on mutual respect, and AFM 257 is doing all it can to preserve that important tradition. That's how we got here. Music can change the world, and we need it now more than ever. I believe this is a critical time for all branches of the music industry to come together, have an honest dialogue, and work together to reach the compromises that will allow all of us to stay in business and then go to Congress united with a comprehensive proposal. If each segment of our community only focuses on itself and its own agenda, we are all doomed to fail. As the whole world looks at Nashville and wonders how we got to be so cool, we are perhaps the one place left on earth that can figure out how we can all work together to make sure the music industry as a whole can survive. Thanks for listening. <laughs>